many debates you've heard that art shapes society. What I'm going to argue is the flip of it, that society drives art. Hence, the societal demand should determine the extent to which art responds to it to survive and self-persist and perpetuate within that regard. Pop culture is tailored to meet the artistic demands of the youth. What I'm going to argue is that, whatever the word is, hedonism is what the youth demands and what the youth resonates with in the modern day world. Hence, for pop culture, which rose specifically to speak to artistic demands of the youth, drives or moves away from this, it's likely going to use lose that with its core supporter base and hence lose the massive impact, massive rele relevance, and all the like common meanings that these guys can credit pop culture with. First thing I'm going to argue is why the counterfactual to self-pleasure, which is self-denial, is equal to self-pain, and that self-pain is illegitimate. I see you are shaking your head. Look at the clarification on the, on, the, on the page, whatever you want to talk about. Because self-pleasure simply means prioritizing yourself, making use of the money that you have, prioritizing your happiness, enjoying yourself and enjoying life, literally living in the moment in ways that ensure that you maximize your pleasure at all points in time. The counterfactual, which is self-denial or sacrifice, which is to say, look at other people, Trim, cut short on the kind of joy and the kind of happiness and exploration that you have for the benefit of other people. The claim here is to say for that self-denial to exist is to cap the extent of happiness that you as an individual enjoy. That limitation on happiness is an illegitimate pain that you subject yourself to. Why? Because the other persons which you are likely to say let those sacrifices benefit and the justification usually for it is you really don't own the benefits that you have. You really don't own the goods that you have because it's by lottery of bet. It's by some other random chance that you've been allocated those resources and so use them for societal good. The justification here is it is true. You don't own them, but in that same vein, that other person for whom reason you want to subject yourself to that threshold of pain to benefit also doesn't own it. And so it's illegitimate to simply say two people that don't own things one person should sacrifice for the other to benefit given that there is no ownership premise that exists on both sides what this means is that in both instances there is things like pleasure that exists people should be free to use their resources for whatever they want to do what I'm going to argue is why the youth in modern day have aggravated towards a trend where they use it for self-pleasure and not for societal benefits and social discourse and all of those things and why that should be the way to go yeah Vincent so no, I, I, I think other things like family ties, all of those transactional things are mandates that exist. When it comes to self-pleasure, it means I should care about the poor person on the street and care about that person's interest. And so instead of going to the club, I should go and donate that money. That's not about giving your mother stipends, etc. So like that clarification really, like you just wasted 15 seconds. The case here is this, that art is not the driver of society. Because in reality, rarely do any of us listen to music and get up and go and do what that music does or tells us to do. Rarely do people watch movies and inflate the value of that movie and the relevance of the things portrayed in that movie so much that they get up to go and do the things that the movie tells them to do. It's the other way around. Movies aggravate towards things that are trending in society to tap into pre-existing preferences in ways that ensure that people can patronize them for them to generate that self-perpetuating cycle and benefit. This framing, given that it's true, does two preemptions. One, the argument that you're likely going to get from these guys' side, that when you portray and popularize hedonism, it generates that culture and behavior in people. It's false because that culture already exists in people, and that's why movies and pop culture is aggravating towards them. Which means even if you oppose the popularization of this, it doesn't drive it away from society because these cultures evolved to meet that trends that existed within society. Why then is the popularization crucial? Because of the demography that pop culture seeks to cater towards. Hold on, I'll take you. Pop culture, and there are so many strands of media, pop culture actually got up 
because of the youth. And so majority of the people that enjoy pop culture, majority of the audience that enjoy pop culture is the youth. The reason why this is crucial is because the youth in trends of today have been anti-religious, breaking away from religious and social constraints, defying the odds and defying social norms and living the free life to be a free soul and maximizing the idea that your individual freedoms and your individual pleasure should be the way to go. For pop culture artists to resonate with this logic, they decided to popularize that same logic in pop culture in a way such that people see themselves in the art that is being portrayed. People see their preferences and their logic and the way in which they see life to be lived in the art that is being portrayed. And that is the way by which pop culture has managed to maintain its relevance within society. What it means is that when you drive away from this, you are driving away from tapping into the preferences of the people that sustain pop culture as an industry. Before I move on, prosper. Yeah, you cannot argue that people determine what is going to be in pop culture because then pop culture is useless. They become pop culture. Because what makes pop culture is that people do it because it's becoming popular. Yes, it's becoming popular, and that's why that art will try to ride on it because I'm not sure art just gets up and does something that nobody is likely going to buy into. Artists create to tap into pre-existing preferences. You need to be able to do, claim why artists don't do this. Like I said, that's why I said the popular notion in debates is that art is so powerful that it's what drives society. The reality is it's society that shapes art to fit into society's preferences. And so you need to be able to prove that counterfactual. You just can't ride on pre-existing arguments and try to say you win this debate. Why then is the breaking down of the pop culture bad? Because on their side, what you're likely going to have is that if you drift away from this popularization, pop culture is going to lose its touch with the youth, which is its core fan base because the youth in modern day world are living outside the skirts of religious constraints that says, be generous. The youth want to go and party. The youth want to enjoy and live a free life. What it means is that the, the, the pop culture that they so value is likely going to lose its relevance, likely going to lose its patronage in the vast majority of instances because it portrays messages that doesn't resonate with people. What it means is that it's going to lose touch with society and crumble. Why is this bad? Because pop culture has become the unique area by which youth artists are excelling because they are tapping into the youthful energy that exists. It means that most youth, art most youth artists on this guy's side are going to struggle to tap, tap into artistic and, and fan bases because you condition them to oppose the very metric that is going to tap into people's pre-existing preferences. The side on up breaks down pop culture inherently. Proud to oppose and propose, sorry. Two, one. Pano, today's beat is clear. It's not about whether pop culture um, whether or not um, the people in society are doing pop culture, or whether like the youth want to do pop culture, or, like, hedonism or practice the act of hedonism, that's not what the debate is about. It's about whether that act that exists within pop culture, that popularization, is a good thing, or, or whether we must support it. So Andrew's telling us that oh, these things are shaped like these things um, are shaped by how society is and whatnot. It's not really the debate whether it is shaped by society or not. Is it something we should support as good? Is it something we should say is good that we should go by right? He has the debate. The, the, um, the DPM should come and do better, right? So like panel from from our side, right? We are going to show you how necessarily it's a bad thing here. He first for pop, first for pop culture in the youth that Andrew so desperately wants to um, so desperately wants to protect, right? But then secondly, I'll show you how necessarily groups have been able to use this as a way to be able to exploit that useful exuberance that exists within pop culture to be able to attain their own selfish, perverse, perverse incentives, right? I'll show you how necessarily those things are inherently problematic. But before I move on to like my math are like to engagement to opening government right so opening government says well it's illegitimate for um, for you to say one um, um one person should um, sacrifice and another person um, should enjoy the resources and whatnot right but then panel especially when we don't agree with his counterfactual of pain and whatnot um, about the counterfactual being pain right the counterfactual of um, the counterfactual of um hedonism right can still be a middle ground right it can be a, it can be it can be an instance or a world where people can be able to um, um, go uh, go after their pleasure but then take into consideration like Self, um, self, um, self. 
self-restraint, right? Um, so trying as much as possible to restrain themselves and understanding that various social um, various social um, factors exist, various cultural factors exist, various economic factors exist within within their pursuit for their own pleasure, right? That is what that's what our world is, right? So in their world, it says, well, like, get, like, do not necessarily care about all those factors. Go, go for your own happiness. I'll show you how necessarily those things are inherently bad, right? So like, on, on pop culture and what necessarily is characterized by and what it looks like, right? So first off, right, pop culture, like as I said earlier, is like full of youth, right? Most of them are energetic. But then second thing is that most of the things that they do within pop culture are trendy things, are things that come off in the short term, are things that they, 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 um, they do in the spare of the moment, right? But then also, like, it is less and less retrospective. So people, like, do not necessarily care about what happens in the, like, what happens after they've done the actions. They just want to do the actions and get a, and get a pleasure, right? The problem is that the popularization and the glamorization is intentional, right? It's intentional in the sense that there, there exist large corporations, large organizations that, 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 that intentionally fund them, that intentionally fund and push, like, and campaigns to be able to ensure that these things go along with to for their brand to for their brand support and what have you right so examples of these things can be seen in the world of fast fashion where brands like Shein will churn out multiple clothes like multiple clothes outlets and multiple clothes in one week like they can churn out like thousand thousand and um, thousand collections in one week just because they want to be able to for the youth to be able to buy these things for the idea of live for yourself be yourself all those things like these are intentional campaigns that's what the popularization in itself looks like are intentional campaigns by majority of these individuals and groups to be able to ensure that they get their own um, this thing perverse in same so you think that their world is bad right but then panel also that glamorization means that it wrote whatever like that glamorization means that it creates the perception that this is a good thing right so it raised what whatsoever like accountability measure that should exist that should exist within these instances right how does how is this possible because when you glamorize something and make it look like oh there's something everybody is doing so it's a good thing right so it means that anything I do can you cannot necessarily hold me accountable for these actions that's like um, um, it's a good thing everybody is doing these things so it means that we should go ahead and then do these things no accountability measure exists in their world because there's, there, nobody is questioning these things as whether they are good or bad. I think that world is flawed. The fact that it's, it's, um, it's, they, are, they are formed by society doesn't mean we just go and say, well, we are all for it, right? But then Pano also understand this, right? But then Pano also understand this, right? For things like social justice movement, right, to be able to like progress, for things like social justice movement to be able to go for it, right, it means it needs like you means you need things like coagulation, right? It means you need people to be able to come together and say, well, I'm going to compromise on certain things to be able to like further my further my advances, right? In these guys' world, right, what happens is that people necessarily care about the other factors about tolerating other people's views and whatnot they go and spill whatever whatever they want to say without necessarily caring about what other people think right the problem is that these things have a propensity to be able to harm the movements that they necessarily want to fight for when you look at things from that perspective right why because people then necessarily see you as someone that's shallow, someone that doesn't care about others, someone that just cares about yourself, right? The problem with this is that then you are you, that ability for you to coagulate, to be able to come out and then fight for that movement that you so desperately want to support and so desperately want to thrive, does not exist. Your world is flawed, your world harms those, those movements, right? But then panel also understand that all black like, for these movements, right, and for society necessarily to develop and thrive, right, need people to be able to come to that consensus, right? In your world, you're supposed to show how, how, how necessarily individuals can decide to exist in isolation and will be able to like, pep, um, and further their own um, their own interests, right? And will be comfortable, right? But in a world where minorities exist, in a world where more, more and more people are suffering, in a like in a world where like um, 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 global warming is becoming like a threat and all those things, you need to be able to show how necessarily individuals can decide to exist in that isolation and still exist and, and still perpetuate their happiness and what um, and what have you, right? But then, panel on like the idea of consumerism and, and corporate control, right? Why do you think those things exist more in their world, right? Why is this true? Because corporations more and more have developed the, have developed the capacity and tools to be able to utilize trends, to be able to utilize campaigns, to be able to shape mentality of the youth. So it says that well, you are not like you are not in trend, you are not in vogue, you are not in style when you don't do what the majority is doing. Like those are, those are the kind of campaigns that um, these corporations have used. So for example, if you don't use an iPhone, or you are not a trendy youth, all those things like are things that um, are, are things that corporations use. So there is the idea of like don't um, live within the moment, do not care about the future, like all those things. Like just go follow your heart and what and what have you. These are things that companies, corporations, used to be able to feather their own personal and personal incentives and, and personal incentives, but not, but not necessarily care about the but not necessarily care about the effects or harm that exists within these guys. Right? But then the problem is that in their world, right, what happens is that corporations can be able to maximize their gains, right? But then what happens is that on the youth that these guys want to protect, right? The idea then becomes that 
these people um these people now look more shallow these people look like they do not care about like um, their, their current surroundings they only care about themselves they don't care about their future plans they don't care about anything the problem with that the problem with this is that then more and more of their use then they, they, they then feel like nobody can hold them accountable for their actions nobody can be able to um, hold them and responsible for their actions we think that their word is flawed right but then panel on the counterfactual and why we say the counterfactual is the middle ground and why the middle ground will work right so first of right we think that in a we think that in a, like in in an in, in a world where you want things to be able to work right so in a world where you want to be able to um the world where you want things to work right there isn't why the middle ground work in a world because you can achieve pleasure right you can you can try as much as possible to achieve pleasure taking into consideration the fact that several people exist within your um, current surrounding the idea that you need to be able to understand that you don't create more enemies that are going to hamper you from being from being able to attain your goals right those things work best in their world because you do not necessarily care about those people you only go step into like whether you step whether i step on toes or not you just go ahead and do those things you think that those things are problematic never been this brought to We think the counterfactual that OO argues is a very weak one, right? Because if you tell us that the counterfactual could be that there is a middle ground for people to fight for, the very fact that we are fighting for that middle ground means that pain is the true counterfactual in today's debate. Two main arguments to show why that counterfactual again is defeating, right? Because we think to fight for self-discipline is to fight your innate desires to, to be curious, to explore, and to seek the very intrinsic trait in all people that is to seek pleasure at all points in time, right? We don't think seeking pleasure means you go hand in hand with being an isolationist, right? You don't think that assertion is proven enough from the bench, right? Another thing we told you is that when they say, oh, look, corporations would prey on the youth's desire and production will be too much i think that argument isn't analyzed enough to show how much the impact would be so detrimental to society because we think for instance if pop culture is so full of showing hedonistic traits right and then industries buy into that and they produce a lot of fancy stuff the production rises so so much prices tend to fall and since Andrew has already told you that society does these things before they are put into pop, pop culture, then it means demand is going to meet its targets, right? Because we think the prices are going to fall. For example, iPhone 6 is now like very, very cheap because these guys produced way too much of it because they kept on depicting it in movies that it's the fancy gadgets to use and every youth wants to use an iPhone, right? Another thing they tell us is that, oh, look, well, people would disregard law if what we preach from OG is that happiness is the ultimate goal in life. We think this argument is very simplistic because one, it disregards the accountability mechanism and the check mechanisms, uh, mechanisms that are already in place in society, right? So for example, the fact that Leonardo DiCaprio says you have to masturbate 15 times a day to feel alpha in movies, right, in Wolf of Wall Street, doesn't mean you can go out and whip your fellows in public right and be masturbating you'll be arrested for that that's like that's a felony right you can't say we preach happiness for people so people can just go ahead and disregard the laws you can go ahead and be sm smoking in public and in unauthorized places that doesn't do justice to the kind of checking mechanisms we have in society with that we realize OO doesn't have a case in today's debate right Two extensions you're going to get from me in my DPM speech and why we think pursuing hedonism is the best thing that could happen to people and pop culture depicting this is absolutely a win-win for everybody. Because we think that the counter-narrative that exists in society is oftentimes when people try to to put their happiness forward and upfront, right? They tend to be stigmatized. That, for the same reason why you get Vincent asking a POI that, oh, you don't care about us, we cared about you when you were, you were young, so now that you are old, you are being selfish, you don't care about us, so selfishness is inherently a bad thing. I think that stigmatization needs to stop. And he doesn't being popular in pop culture helps prevent that stigmatization. I'll show you how, right? We think happiness is subjective and the aggregate happiness index is, a, is an accumulation of multiple individual happiness of certain the amounts of pain that they experience so to the point where people see that oh it's okay for you for us not to try to demonize people for seeking happiness then people are going to be more comfortable pursuing the things that makes them happy and when more people are pursuing things that makes them happy we think it has two impacts right we think one the happiness index rises on aggregate and when that happens it means that Social interactions in society overall are going to be much more positive. Why? Because human beings are social creatures. We interact with each other. The more you interact with happy people, it's fair to say it's going to give up on you, right? But then secondly, 
when people are more happy, there is a tendency to want to be more receptive of opinions, to be more receptive of uh, ideas, to be more receptive of narratives, to try to experiment with stuff, right? Because you're, you're not bothered about trying to please what other people think and trying to please other people's uh, traits and what they want you to do, right? Second extension you get from me is to talk about how pop culture gives the youth validation, especially if it portrays hedonistic traits, right? We think youth does these things because it's inherently built in them to want to do it. We think biology proves this. When they, their body hormones changes and they start getting bonus in the middle of the night ETC, they are going to want to seek porn. Not because movies told them to go seek porn. We think they just do it because biology and the changes in their body warrants that. That just buys into Andrew's framing of how pop culture writes on what already exists in society. You come by the fact that movies tell people to do what they want to do. If that is true, then it means if movies also portray this hedonistic traits it validates the way the youth already feels about themselves it makes them feel less of outcasts why is it important for youth to feel included in what goes on in society and how they feel about themselves right because one we think if for nothing at all it gives them career opportunities for example the reason why there is a rise in social media influencing and twitch gaming for people and the youth still making money for such things is because they are pursuing their pleasure. They do not want to work a conventional 9 to 5 job. They do not want to put on a tie and go to college to buy a degree. They want to slouch in their couch and play Fortnite 24-7, laugh and stream it and still make some money, right? In this guy's world, they will tell you you not becoming a medical doctor is probably given an opportunity cost off to someone and you should feel bad for yourself for playing games all day but we think it's okay in our world because like the happiness of that person is something they're entitled to and they're responsible for right we think that whichever idea that pop culture portrays right company is going to write on it to explain the youth in any ways to as an engagement to what you get from brain right this means, A, you need to prove why companies writing on hedonism specifically is bad because you're going to write on anything else that they see in society anyways. These guys are hungry for profit. The second thing is they also had to explain how pop culture survives when it loses touch and relevance with its support base. Literally, the name pop culture means popular culture. Wikipedia would tell you that literally this is something that is so popular with the youth. I don't know how many seconds it takes you to look up this thing in the dictionary, right? What this means is that if it loses touch with the people it's meant to, you know, please the Gen Z and the guys born in 2005, henceforth, I mean, we think it's going to die out, right? We do not want a crucial element of entertainment for a very crucial part of society dying out, right? We think if that happens, then the argument about making the youth feel isolation, uh, uh, ostracized in society are all things that are going to apply. At the end of today's debate, we think the counterfactual that Upbench has to defend is a world where people try to actively indulge in self-denial and subject themselves to self-pain just to please a bunch of other people with no assurances that those people are going to do the same and the impact that would have on society as a whole. If for nothing at all, we think the fact that your pleasure and your ultimate goal in life is like your responsibility, nobody gives an F about you. We think hedonism is the best way for people to live, right? So just like yesterday's debate about hypersexualization, the fact that a lot of people want to see it does not mean that the impact is good or it's something that we should condone in society. But that's why a chunk of their premise falls off. So your justification can be that a lot of people want to do it, right? Your justification has to be that is it a good thing, right? If you condone it, if you make people do it the more, it's the ones that are going to give us beneficial impact as society. Second piece of clarity, right, is about the counterfactual that we are supposed to defend on our side, right? There's a concession that as a human race, we are constantly trying to survive. That means that we are constantly trying to maximize our pleasure. But there's always a compromise. This is important because without that compromise, it means that when you maximize your pleasure at all costs, it means that someone else is going to hurt, is going to get hurt. That means that someone else is equally going to maximize their pleasure at your expense. So the compromise ensures that everyone exists on a balanced field such that society can cushion everyone at any point in time. So the counterfactual is supposed to defend is a world where people maximize their pleasure in a self-restraining way, right? It means that we are seeking profit, you should care about whether people are being hurt from your exploitation of natural resources. You should care about other people, right? So it's not a fact that you are trying to like, you know, just forgot we want to sit down and feel pain all day, right? That's can be the that can be the counterfactual, right? It's a world where we do it in a more reasonable way, right? That's the counterfactual that we're supposed to defend, and that's what we defend, right? I'm I'm going to be showing a couple of things. Number one, why the pursuit of pleasure using hedonism is short-termistic and it's something that we can't condone. 
why self-actualization on their side is not good enough, right? And what a society where they, like, the society they envision, right? Why the society is bad. But then before that, a couple of responses to these guys. They say, well, pop culture is going to re lose their relevance, right? Because these are the things that they write on to survive, right? We think that there are other counter narratives that are equally entrenched in society that we can, we can use, right? For example, empathy. Empathy is a leftist idea. Most young people are leftists, right? People think about social advocacy, you being like empathetic towards other people. These are other things that are entrenched in society and people like to hear, right? You can equally implement that, those things to become more relevant, like to re relevant in society, right? Second thing they say is that they try to then like strum on brain scales when you talk about accountability, right? Accountability is not, in, in this sense, doesn't mean that, you know, you are, you know, doing working in public, right? Accountability is personal. So for example, instead of you to be studying, you are partying all night, right? So it's personal accountability because you're trying to maximize pleasure at all costs, right? You're trying to just focus on the short-termistic things, right? So it's about personal accountability and how people lose that, right? I'm going to be analyzing in depthly why that is bad for society, right? So, Panom, why hedonism is not a sustainable way of pursuing pleasure? Number one, the pleasure you get is usually short-termistic in nature. Why? Because maximizing pleasure comes at a huge cost of pain in the end. Example, when you are vaping as a, as a youth, right, those are the kind of things that the hedonist, hedonistic uh, approach uses, right? You, like, as a youth, you can vape and do all those things, right? You then begin to feel the impact when you're in your 40s and you're in your 50s, right? When you start developing the lung cancer and things like that, right? And so, people then feel the consequences in the future. Why is this form of seeking pleasure one that is bad? Because usually, people prioritize or people, um, uh, like, like, um, like, it's more painful to people, right? When they feel the pain in the future, how do we know this is true? That's why people prefer to save money and enjoy it in the future, right? Because when they enjoy the pleasure in the future, it's much more impactful. They feel more self-actualized, right? But you enjoy the pain when you're, like, when you're feeling the pain in the future, it is more regretful, right? You begin to feel more regret, and that's why the award is bad. But secondly, maximizing pleasure comes at a cost of not compromising, i.e., you ignore the needs of others. What does this look like? It looks like the youth constantly saying, oh, don't, you don't owe anything to your children. Them. You don't owe anything to your parents. Those are the kind of things that these things promote, and that's what Andrew tries to run away from, right? Why is this bad? Because on the other side, it's not difficult to get help because people are constantly trying to maximize their pleasure and minimize their pain. Because when you're helping other people, it means that you are reducing your pleasure. Because giving your money to someone is reducing your pleasure, it's reducing your pleasure. It means that non compromise means that, like, people then have little incentive to help, and then people on the other side become more isolationist, right? Because when you're compromising, you're trying to help people, right? Like, when you're compromising and trying to help people, it means that you are reducing your pleasure and increasing your pain. What that means is that because it's not a popular narrative on the other side, people don't want to lose their, like, lose their pleasure. It means that they become more isolationist and don't want to help people. Why is this bad? Because minorities are hurt, right? Because like, if people don't want to compromise, or the elites or people who have privilege in society don't want to compromise their pleasure. It means that it's not difficult for social advocacy campaigns and helping poor people and helping the less privileged within society. Why is this something that is bad? Because you need this in the future. As I've already explained, right? So let's take a cycle of, of, of life, for instance. When you're a youth and you're being hedonistic, right? You want to maximize your pleasure at all costs. It means that you won't care about helping old people or the old person gets on the train. And the same thing is going to happen to you when you go, grow old, right? That means that people, when you grow old, people now have less incentive to take care of you and to do things for you, right? And that's why that's, that's bad. But then why is this important, right? Because people are less accountable to themselves as I already analyzed at the beginning of my speech, right? You party all night and steady and not steady because you want to maximize your pleasure. But secondly, the absence of compromise that people tolerate each other less and don't want to understand other points of view and don't want to other, understand other points of view. That means that there's less societal progression, right? Because people want to isolate and not interact with other people. Why is our counterfactual better? Number one, individuals consider the pleasure of others when pursuing their own pleasure. I, I care about whether people are being hurt by my mind, right? It means that people take turns in enjoying, right? I've already analyzed the cycle of life, like example, it means that people take turns in enjoying. It means that when you become, when somebody is equally taking care of you, it means that there's a cushion, right? Now, pleasure on our side is more democratized and everybody begins to feel pleasure at, at certain points in time on their lives, right? It means, that, it means that, like, pleasure on our side is more democratized and more spread across. It means that people on our side are generally more happy, right? It means that the happiness index is more general on our side, right? Why is that, why, like, why is that word further bad, right? Because the more it validates the gaps and societal disadvantages that exist, right? Means that people with privilege, right, do not really want to care about other people, right? Why is it something that is bad? 
right? Now, this way, this way the debate is, right? Because the major case you're getting from these guys is that, oh, well, survival instincts can kick in, right? That's why people would likely coagulate. The reason why this is not true is because when you're in Europe, there's no incentive for you to care about people in Africa suffering from malaria. That means that survival instincts will not kick in at, any, at all points in time. It's the compromise I repeat is what's going to kick in that people in Europe will want to help people in Africa. Right? And that's why their world is bad. It means that on the other side, you degenerate the human race because people wouldn't want to comprom like, compromise and coagulate to solve societal problems. It means that societal problems are more entrenched on your side of the house, right? And most of these things have generic impacts, that rip like ripple impacts that happen on your side. What do we learn from outside of the house? We show how people are less accountable to themselves. People then regret their actions when they grow up, especially the youth, because these are the things that the youth is what hedonism targets, right? When they grow up, they begin to regret, right? Because they maximize their pleasure at, at all costs. When you're a youth and you don't think of other people, when someone is not, like, when you grow up and someone is not letting you on the train, you begin to regret and wish that you had helped someone else, right? So that regret is something that we think that something is bad. So even though you might want it now, the aftermath you're going to regret, and that's something that we think that is bad. Societal problems are more entrenched on your side. Society degenerates, people tolerate each other less. Proudly open opposition. So we think pleasure is not limited to self. Pleasure could be driven from the care about people, so as satisfaction. And that's the underlying principle of hedonism. The extreme world that open opposition paints is problematic because they think once somebody practices hedonism, it means the person is completely selfish and the person actually cares about only him or herself to the extent that it's particularly detrimental to society. And that's an extreme argument. If they want the alternative to be a world where people are able to compromise, then they should also consider a world where in God's world, people are able to care about other people because their self-satisfaction and pleasure is driven from the kind of intimacy that comes to support from the other environment. Either, either, otherwise, they are out. All things like friendship, character, selflessness are virtues of instrumental value, but they are means to an end, either by increasing the pleasure or by diminishing pain. In our world, if we are able to provide shorter alternatives for these same end products, then at the end of the day, we are doing the same thing. We think we ought to embrace it. If you want to use examples like lung cancer, first of all, lung cancer, it's not true that when you smoke, and when you get lung cancer, that's an example, I know. But then what you need to understand is that what happens is that somebody could actually feel okay because at the end of the day, my useful days, I enjoyed my days, I did smoke, so lung cancer is just something that came out. Of. I need to understand the consequences and accept it. I'm so happy. We think that particular thing is very much important. But a desire of self-satisfaction, a friend satisfaction, family satisfaction, and community approval are detrimental to attaining the maximum pleasure in most instances because you always ought to make sure that you give people the leeway to actually impede upon your self-satisfaction, which is something that we are totally against in this particular debate. At that particular point, it is out. But they say there is no coagulation for societal progress. First of all, I showed you that hedonism does not ex exist on the extremist ideas where people are never going to care about just their selfishness. Some people are going to drive their pleasure from communal protection. And even in the extreme case, where people decide to be extremely selfish, we think things like family ties are always existent to check them. So my pleasure will be like, oh, because I am a father, my pleasure is driven from helping my family. We think these things already exist in status quo. These are not exclusive in their work. We say that youth might fully copy what is promoted. They have not been able to prove that it's directly proportional. It is not true that because we saw Asaka boys holding car classes on the street, we are also holding car classes on the street. But secondly, there are already state mechanisms that are already checking this class system to instill rationality on people. And that's the report of going out to pull out guns, even if they see it in, in pop culture. Because the extent at which state structures are checking them is existent and it's enough to punish them, to hold them against all these things. We think that's incredibly important. What OG does is OG focuses on the need to protect pop culture. That's fine. What we do is highlight that pop culture is driven by two main forces. First, the society, which is mainly the youth, which opening government tells you. But secondly, the creator, the artists themselves, who ought to promote the, the idea of pop culture. Meaning for us, for us to promote the existence of pop culture in the first place, we ought to maximize the interest of many of these two groups. Opening government gives you the first one, but without the most important entity that drives it, so the artists themselves that do that, you don't get the most important, and then their, their impact is largely missing. Meaning without us, OG's analysis would not have its true impact, so our mechanism actually makes that happen. But first, realize that human beings have the intrinsic nature of self-satisfying themselves. Pop culture is driven by the ability to live in the movement without considering things that are likely to cause you pain. 
What it means is that the existence of pop culture is contingent on the main driving force, which is the creator, to create things that people are able to follow and say, so we are living in a moment, or we are happy to live in a particular moment. Why should hedonism be central to that particular idea? First, people have that intrinsic motivation to self-satisfy themselves, an egoistic motivation. People have that particular self-ability to self-satisfy themselves, which is consistent with the human nature in of itself. We think it's not bad or it's wrong for you to punish people because they have that intrinsic ability to protect themselves. But secondly, OO says people have, should be selfless for societal coagulation. What they need to understand that even the act of selflessness in of itself is selfishness because Bill Gates would always want to donate high amount of money because he wants to get that recognition. He was a man that helped us to promote our care pandemic. We think these instances still include selfishness and they are both not different in any way within the main problem of selfishness already exists on that particular spectrum. The problem with society. Notice that society redraws what satisfies them at every point in time. Which means that for you, as an, a youth or as a pop culture artist, you need to change your personality to meet these demands. We think it's incredibly bad because we don't choose the way we are born, we don't choose the way we are socialized. At a point where these things don't necessarily translate to societal let me say, um, uh, distraction, like they're not able to prove, because I show you how it's not necessarily true that people are going to be carrying all these things on the street. Yeah. It means that it's rather illegitimate for you to force people to change their personality just to meet these demands. But secondly, hedonism is non exclusive of selfishness. Your ability to maximize your pleasure could be contingent on the support that comes from the youth. So the ability of this particular artist to meet this particular demand promotes consumerism because your only ability is you want your people, their youth, to actually buy into your idea. So you self-satisfy the consumer's um, need, you self-satisfy their motivation or their aim, and that's the reason why you promote the idea of pop culture in of itself, which is very incredibly important to promotion of pop culture in society. We think in their world, what you do is that you care about what the conservatives are always going to think because in their world they think it's only right if in, in this particular age, what is only right is when you're actually wearing like the, the, the decent things that you always, how should I even put it? Like, do not smoke, do not drink, all those things are the most moral things that they define as their concept of morality, that's particularly very problematic. But lastly, within the maximization of pleasure in pop culture is important because this is a space of always negative influence and negative energy. We think it's important that people that exist within the space are able to maximize themselves. There is constant cancellation, call out of this particular artist just because of a minimal Twitter comment. We think it's incredibly important they find a way to maximize their happiness in a particular space. If pleasure comes from the disregard from these particular draconian situations that exist on these particular spaces, we ought to maximize it. But this, we reduce the stress associated with these particular spaces with their constant fight and flight response that is triggered these particular artists just because of their constant need to actually self-satisfy society. It's one that depresses them and it's one that harms them in totality. We think at best, what we need to do is promote the interest of one, the pop culture itself, something that we ought to promote because it's an, an, it's, um, let me say, an industry that helps us to, the easiest thing is to, let's say, release stress. But secondly, the creators themselves that help to promote that particular ideology must be promoted. In a world where they are able to maximize that by choosing hedonism, we think we ought to support that world. It is not true that hedonism is absolute selfishness, but even if it is, we have shown you why that's so important. Here, here. in three, two, one. Now, the problem with today's debate is that a large pool of the argumentation you've gotten is majorly generic. Everybody talks about how hedonism looks like popularly. They don't talk about how hedonism is portrayed in pop culture specifically. Because if today's motion was the popularization of hedonism is bad, then a lot of people would win this debate. But today's debate says the popularization of hedonism in pop culture. That means we need to question exactly how hedonism is popularized in pop culture. How do they make it look like? What makes it specifically bad with pop culture's rendition of hedonism? Because other, other um, facets of society could particularly popularize hedonism and we wouldn't have a problem. So the question in today's debate is, within the, within the um, um, confines of pop culture, why is hedonism bad? But the most important thing I need to do before I move on in today's debate, majorly because like, I think it would be fun, is to engage the very idea and the very premise of OG's case. Because the idea is individuals are the ones who determine exactly how pop culture goes. Societies de de determine exactly how pop culture goes and not pop culture shaping society. We think that that very idea is like one that is shaky because of a number of reasons. One, 
realize that individuals are all unique and their desires are manifold. What it means is that there is not a commonality of desires that exist between people. Why is this important? It's important because in creating a unilateral and uniform human behavior or human desire, that can only happen if society preaches that rhetoric through certain tools. What do these tools look like? They look like three things. One, through socialization. Two, through societal conditioning. And three, through character validation. Why do we know that that can only happen or mostly happen with pop culture? Because of two things. It means one, with popularizing an idea, you need tools with which you popularize that idea to get that socialization, conditioning, and everything I listed to you. One of the many tools that is used to do that is social media and, and like and mass media. Without the, without the possibility of media being able to proliferate that idea, the ability of that idea being able to reach everybody and that rhetoric being able to sell is particularly difficult. That is why marketing of the iPhone was not successful until media itself was used as a tool. Because the reason why you don't have certain people like preaching their, um, their products on, like, on the internet is because largely they don't need to. We think that to the very extent where we realize that is important. But secondly, we think when you create a confirmation bias, that is the only time actions are validated. What does this mean? This guy is doing what I am doing. That guy is doing what I am doing. That third guy is doing what I am doing. I would do it. Why is this important? Because we can concede that certain people, certain people wanted to already masturbate. We can concede to that. But when I see Vincent masturbating, Brain masturbating, Celon masturbating, I think I should also masturbate without thinking twice. Because in human behavior, the inability to be able to make individual, individual decisions devoid of societal pressure is one that is absent. What this means is that the popularity of an action determines whether or not people are going to actually be tweaked to make that action. That, in of itself, defeats that premise. Why is this also important? Because CG bandwagons on this idea. It means that I equally need to point out to you exactly how we erode agency through pop culture specifically. Because they say that Asaka boys are holding cutlasses, but not everybody is holding cutlasses in society. I'll show you why not everybody is holding cutlasses and why Asaka boys still have that power, even though you claim that they don't. We think that even with things that people find difficult to do, the reason why they do not do it is not just because the idea has not been validated. It's because, one, either they don't need to do it to get whatever desires that you tell them that they will get. So, for example, as a cowboy say that you need to harm people or you need to scam in order to become rich. If I'm a rich kid like Elisha who has blockchain on his side, I don't need to scam because I don't need to do it. But if I'm a poor guy who lives in the trenches of Quadaso, I would most probably think that as a cowboy said it, I'm in a position where I need to do it, then I would do it. What does that mean? It means that human agency is predicated upon the unique context within which they, work, they, they live within. What does this also mean? It means that the rhetorics that you preach are more susceptible to minority groups who originally were already in the trenches and would have probably done that action because of the positionality they find themselves in. What does that mean then? It means that inherently, the harms that will come off of whatever thing you print are not going to be harms that are going to be manifold. Not everybody is going to hold a cutlass, but more people in the trenches will hold a cutlass because now they've been in a position where they need to question what they are doing because a lot of people are telling them that if you don't take a cutlass, you cannot become as rich as these guys in society. But why is this specifically important in today's debate? Because we need to be able to establish how hedonism comes across in pop culture. In pop culture, there is a recognition of human desire and equally, there's, a, there's an acknowledgement that the tools or resources to attain pleasure are minimum. Why do we know that this is true? Because we've seen various scenes in Wall Street, in Wolf of Wall Street, where he actively tells his clients and tells his workers that they need to rip people off if they want to become as rich as they want to be. We've listened to a lot of music where they actively tell you that you need to go to whatever extent you have to go to to be able to engage in this. Now, this analysis is going to be different from OO because OO talks about intergenerational justice. I'll do something different. The reason why we think that that's particularly difficult is because Pop culture glamorizes hedonism as something that should come at whatever cost, be it personal or be it societal. If it's a personal cost, we probably would not have a problem. But to the extent that more often than not, say societal cost, like ripping people off to be comfortable, we don't like it. I'll take opening. Well. So, so 
we think that it's important to recognize that. But why exactly is it bad? Because of two things. One, because it constitutes you actively preaching that harm, harming other people is a legitimate cause of action and a legitimate line of behavior. Why is that particularly bad? Because it's not good to have a particular culture that is um, like permeating the rhetoric that people should like particularly act in a way that's harmful to other people. Especially when these individuals you are preaching to are very susceptible to accepting what you are saying. So minorities will probably do that action because they, would, they are susceptible to it. A rich guy might not fall for what pop culture is preaching to him because he doesn't need to rob to become rich. But you get people who actively do that. But more importantly, and this engages CG because they say like, like hedonism could be I am happy from making other people happy. Even that one is bad because it strips individuals of their humanity because you see them as the means to an end. So when it does not favor you, you do not help them, you do not do good, that does not help for societal protection and societal proliferation, we think that that is bad. In today's debate, for you to be able to accept who wins the debate, you need to be able to understand to the very extent that certain people are more susceptible to a particular manner of behavior. We need to make sure that we insulate society from making those people become victims. Because we ourselves failed them, and that's why they are in the trenches. Very proud to propose. Oppose. Three, two, one. So panel, three things I'll be doing in today's debate. First is to show why the opposition bench doesn't place anywhere in today's debate. So first, dealing with Prosper's case, what he says at first is that, okay, there is no common like desire of a people, so you cannot form a certain commonality. The problem with that is that it affects these people's case about compromise. Once you don't have choices that are consistent and everyone agrees to, you find difficulty in forming a particular common compromise that entire society can come together and create like, like help for everyone, right? But then secondly, he says that, okay, validation in and of itself, like from these pop cultures, and it's really bad because at the end of the day, like it affects society at its core. But we think that that is, that is better because one, the weaknesses and strength of people are better exploited in this particular world when people are able to self-express. The, the reason why that is better is that in this people's world, you create an unfair narrative or an unfair societal expectation on them that they are supposed to follow without giving them any alternatives. What that does is that it further entrenches the inequality that exists. But then also Prosper says that, okay, we are preaching a world where we say people should do what they want at all costs. We think that that is proper because one, since there exists a certain con like consistent choice that people make and it conforms to their body autonomy, we think that it gives them one self-satisfaction. But then secondly, there is that self-culpability that exists. So people are able to take like their own like battles up and deal with themselves. The self-regrets that exist are like proportional to the self-benefits and we do not think that we lose that out on today's debate, right? Those like things that exist. Opposing to their world whereby we constantly blame society for things that society has entrenched on us without giving us the opportunity to self like uh, like actualize right we think that's comp on, comp on the comparative our world is better but then he lastly says that's okay we use people as a means to an end even if we are like like selflessly like self selfless in helping people we think that on the comparative too our world is better because it is our for like our consistent choice it is consistent with the intrinsic nature of human beings to be able to choose so it is better for me to choose freely that I want to help this person than in their world when they say that I should regret what I want to do because there is a certain commonality that we must satisfy to. But then to these guys, so they preach a world whereby there is the probability of us creating a general happiness. The problem with that is that inequalities that exist in society always affect the poor at the long run. What we experience is that rich people always think that they are doing the poor a favor. What you do in their world is that you continue to entrench that narrative where like, rich people think they are doing the poor a favor. In our world, on a comparative, we think that poor people are able to weaponize things like that they have in, like, they have in specificity, right? That things that they cannot share in common with people. What, that, what happens is that they are able to prize these things and help, like, self-help themselves and benefit from these things. So natural resources of poor countries, they are able to think like nationalistically and benefit from them and like w without thinking that they are doing any harm but at the end of the day the comparative like the comparative advantage is that you don't necessarily have to depend on somebody because you don't think that okay we have to wait for rich people to come and find like us empathetic but we are able to weaponize few things that are going to be sold or done to, to help ourselves we think that that self-help that exists is a better comparative it, that brings general happiness what happens is that the rich continue to be rich but then the poor do not lose out because it doesn't become the choice 
choice of the rich people to help them or not. But then se secondly, these people say society thrives on empathy, and when you do things like these, you do not promote tolerance and social protection. That's why Archimedes' extension about how social systems already exist to help people. But then things like intergenerational wealth that are created from family ties and inter like cross marriages are always able to self-sustain people. What that means is that, that their isolation their isolationist policies or like ideas that they force on people in this particular area do not exist because of things like inter-ethnic marriages and cross like like the people always relate together in a social like in a social community. You do not expect that your husband's money is not your money. We do not think that things like love make people self like relate to their families and the approximation for them to love their families is something that gives them pleasure. We think that's very very important. But the reason why we win today's debate is because first. On the idea of middle ground, we already say that the idea of compromise should be based on the ability for us to agree on something common. Prosper shoots them on the foot when they say we can never have a common ground on what we all desire. So you cannot achieve that at the end of the day. But then secondly, these people say that okay, companies thrive on these benefits and produce more. These people already deal with that when they tell you that okay, demand like demands will always like break up supply. But then secondly, we don't think that it's necessarily bad intrinsically for people to buy things that they can afford. We do not think people take irrational decisions on their expenditure because at the end of the day, they always have an approximate benefit. The fact that they are able to look good and what they wear, they approximate themselves to a certain image. We think that that happiness that they get is a good reward and it's not theft on any day on the part of these people. But certainly on legitimacy, these people engage on validation that you get. But then Archimedes tells you secondly that the idea of self-pain itself is illegitimate. It's better when you allow people to be able to self-actualize and make decisions than it's really conform and are consistent with their inherent nature. But then fourthly, we think that the benefits that exist in our world are ones that are exclusive but at best even if these people are making any sense we still get those benefits with lesser harms on personal individuals who have to take personal decisions because we owe that agency to our own self to self-actualize but then lastly what distinguishes us from our opening is what Archimedes says one the stakeholders in today's debate the youth and one the artists we believe that the youth largely benefit because they can relate to this but then secondly is how we could like the popularization help artists to be able to sell their works and create an economic niche for them. We also think that it gives artists the opportunity to portray like societal harms and that this is a positive contribution that necessarily they can give to society. In today's debate, you prioritize who is able to engage largely on what the principle of people enjoying what they like propose for themselves as against what society proposes to them and the effects that exist in both worlds. But then secondly, you want to look at who is able, better able to portray the benefits that they claim and is able to show that, okay, at the end of the day, even if there exist marginal benefits in the end of the world, the underlying principle that humans must always live on, we don't think that we erase the like, ideas of socialism and communal support. We think that these are consistent with, like, with things like social support system. But the reason why that is important is because people donate to social policies deliberately. That is the debate. My enjoyment is that I'm able to donate to a charity home that is consistent with what I feel in terms of humanity. Our humanity is not eroded when we engage in these things. We believe that that better, that better like, ability for us to self-actualize and self-make decisions that affect the larger society and ourselves importantly is something that is important. Proud. <laughs> Panel, the people who act according to the dictate of popular culture are not the upper class or the middle class. It is usually the lower class and minorities who have little or no alternative due to the peculiar situations that they find this, themselves in. This power of popular culture or minorities is bad with the situation of Hinduism because popular culture preaches that you can and should harm innocent third parties in pursuit of your self-pleasure or self-happiness. That is why Jordan Belfort in Wolf of of Wall Street thinks that it is okay to put the money of innocent people into bar stocks so that he makes money and live a lavish life. This means that individuals
This means that looking at the nature of popular culture, there is a group of individuals who are vulnerable to the kind of influence that it causes, and that is why we won't support it on any day. Then again, Prosper tells you that every human being is unique. This means that there is a variety of ways to attain that particular pleasure to suit the uniqueness of human nature. This is because popular culture cannot advance all the unique ways of pleasure. This means that popular culture is then selective to the behaviors they want to. The exclusionary nature of this is what we regret because once they exclude it, they force minorities to approximate to the kind of standard that they set. That is why we regret it. We think the skewing and, and the straw manning from um, Mahadi is something that you need not to pride but moving on to engagement to him. Then they say, oh, artists drive popular culture. This means that they dictate what kind of egoism and, and which kind of pleasure that they want. It means that the problem that Prosper points to you in, in its extension is something that is very important because they would always have an incentive to make sure that they make, they make um, cultures that these particular minorities cannot approximate to and that is something that we find very problematic on their side. It means that these minorities are vulnerable because of the kind of influence that these people People have with popular culture and have within the spaces that they permeate. That is why we find it very problematic. Again, the actor is immoral because they get to cherry pick which kind of behavior they want to exist within that particular popular culture and we think that that is a problem for the artist which is their biggest stakeholder in that. Then they say, oh, selflessness in itself is selfishness. Prosper takes this out because Prosper tells you selfishness is when interests are involved, when it is a means to an end. Selflessness means that you even do things with no strings attached, which even puts you at, at a disadvantage, which means that pursuing selflessness, you put yourself in a point of pain as opposed, as opposed pleasure. We think their argumentation on that, on that is something that we need not to prioritize. Then they say, oh, we need... There's a flight response that exists in popular culture, and that is something that is very bad. Panel note, popularization means that you dampen the other rhetoric that balance this narrative within those particular spaces out. Because popular culture allows for expression of various views, which means that making other rhetoric unpopular is unjustified, that necessitating why we shall never support this, which means that backlash and council culture is, a, is an effective way for us it's an effective way for us to allow competing rhetoric to exist. In a world where there's a popularization of Hinduism that, portray, that portrays one form of narrative that exists, we think it is very problematic because we need to allow other or competing rhetoric that competes against Hinduism to exist. Popularization is something that we regret on their side. Now let's engage opening governments. Now they say that art is not a driver of society. Prosper engages that to tell you that anything that allows individuals to socialize or condition themselves is a driver of socialization. At a point where we prove to you that art is a form of socialization that affects the world views of individuals, it means that one, the premise that they preach to us is something that is very false. Because when you look at popular culture, it is the way of life of individuals within a particular context. Because popular culture doesn't um, remain static, but most of the time, uh, Nothing remains static, but it is most of the time volatile to the kind of interest that exists, means that it has the ability to shape the kind of um, social conditions and the per uh, perception of individuals, especially the minorities that we need to prioritize in that particular regard. It means that popular culture is not restricted to any specific location, thereby um, allowing us to contribute to the development of our worldview. In a world where it has such power, we think it is very problematic. It is something that that we regret on any day. Then again, they say we are inherently hedonistic. Two engagements to that. Even if this is true, one, individuals are not islands, which means that the idea of only buying into self-pleasure and neglecting the consequences is never true because the interdependence that exists has the potential to hurt the individuals themselves. That is the stance these guys take. That is to say that, oh, Hinduism hurts the individuals themselves. The extension that we give to you is that at a point where when you advance self-pleasure, it has the ability to affect other members of the society or society themselves is something that we find problematic because they say oh 
once you smoke, you get lung cancer. We say, oh, feel free, you can smoke, prioritize those things. But at the point where preaching of these particular things, that is selective by the popular culture, that is to tell you that use the money of innocent people to advance your selfish interests within those particular spaces are things that affect other third parties. That is something that we regret on any day and we are less likely to buy into that. Then again, they assume that self-pleasure always makes us happy. Self-pleasure is to make people cope and a mechanism make self-pleasure is to make people cope and also escape from their troubles that they go into. It means that it does not necessarily make these people happy, but to be able to cope with the kind of situations that they find themselves into, which means that inherently this is not happiness, but coping with sadness. Even if this is not true, the outcome of happiness, which is an emotion, cannot be necessarily tied to the activities that we engage in. Then they tell us that, oh, popular culture gives them validation. And and that is a tension in the team. Andy tells you that art is not a driver of society. It is the youth that drives art. But then why would the youth then rely on popular culture for validation of their behaviors and their attitude within those particular spaces? We think you need to punish them for that particular inconsistency. We do not buy into that. Then moving on panel, we think that pain in the pursuit of selflessness is good. When pop culture preaches it, because when you um, sacrifice the feel of pain for someone to feel comfortable, then they also do the same in the future for you to also feel happy and comfortable. The reciprocity that comes as a result of this particular action means that we are able to protect the interest and the perpetuity of individuals within a particular lifetime. It means that in a world where we prioritize self-interest at the detriment of the kind of... Um, at the, at the point of uh, reciprocity that exists, we think it is very problematic and we need not to buy into. But before that, Andy. Yes, so, pop culture portrays lots of things such as violence, etc. What we're against is the portrayal of violence, like robbery, etc. I'm not sure why that's oh. so much. See, you see, the tools to achieve hedonism is what we are targeting. But at the point where the victims or the consumers of this particular action are mostly minorities and they are mostly susceptible and vulnerable to the kind of things that popular culture cherry picks and force these particular minorities to uphold because of the kind of influence and the kind of um, accreditation that they put to it is something that we regret on any day. It is not necessarily because of anything that hurts other third parties parties hurt the minorities, we regret it because of that. But what do you get from closing opposition? We say that the expression of Hinduism in popular culture is good, but not the expression of the individuals themselves, which means that as a, at a point where your self-pleasure, prioritizing it, goes at the detriment of society, we think it is very problematic at the end of the day, because sometimes the things you prioritize as an individual, for example, um, um, drinking while driving has the potential to cause an accident on the road which hurts another individual. Prioritizing your self-pleasure, that is to say, anytime I feel like taking in alcohol, I need to choose it regardless of the context, regardless of the circumstances that I find myself has the potential of hurting people. That is something that we regret. Creation of conf confirmation bias that Prosper tells you about because the popularity of an action erodes the agency of the person himself. Secondly, human agency is based on the unique position and situation and context. That is why these particular minorities are more vulnerable because they use this particular popular culture to advance narratives that these people cannot necessarily do but pushes them to uh, meet those particular standards. That is what we regret on any day. The problem is when the consequences of Hinduism is more on a societal level, we don't have a problem if the consequences is on an individual or personal level. We think that these guys and the manner of which they do things are most of the time extreme. OO talks about intergenerational justice, but we talk about the protection of minorities in status quo because some of the standards and the cherry picking that they do is something that we regret. Proud to.